The Saints just won their second preseason game of the season. They are 2-0. It was a pretty good game. There are some ups and downs, but there's a lot of takeaway from this game, and we're going to go into all that and cover that all in this episode. Before we get into all the details about the game, the players, who won, what are some of the winners and trending up players, some of the losers and trending down players. So we'll get into all of that later in this episode. Before we get into that, if you plan on going to a live event this year, like an NFL game, NBA game, concert, anything like that, Make sure you use SeatGeek. SeatGeek gives you good options, green being good. Those are the good deals. Those are probably the ones you want to target. Red is probably the bad deals. You want to leave those alone and kind of stay away from them. And, you know, if you plan on using SeatGeek and you get a good deal and all that, use my code WHODATSNATION for $20 off your purchase. Just save you some, some money, all right? And, uh, yeah, let's dive into the Saints and Chargers game. So, we didn't see any of the starters. We didn't see Derek Carr, Michael Thomas, Olave Lattimore, Demario Davis, Pete Warner, Kim Jordan, like the big names. Um, of the starters, I want to say we probably only saw Trevor Penning and maybe if you consider like Brian Brzee and Peyton Turner starters. Um, we did see Paulson Adebo and Alante Taylor. I think that battle is starting to clear up a little bit more. We saw a little bit more of the cornerback two battle. Um, I'll give my thoughts on that in just a little bit. So we got to see some of the more i guess depth guys last week you saw Derek card in the stars first drive and then we saw some of the twos and then but we didn't really get to see a lot of guys like shaq davis brian edwards we saw some of jake hayner ellis merriweather we saw a lot of kendra miller so this is a game where we got to see more of the twos and the threes because the saints and chargers had joint practices that's basically better than their preseason game for the starters they're playing against start the Chargers starting defense and then the Saints defense is playing the Chargers starting offense all day the whole time for two straight hours better than a game you're getting reps one-on-ones team drills seven on seven you're getting different looks throughout the days throughout the two days of camp um, of these joint practices and I think that was good and I think the Saints made the right move by not playing the starters because they got their work in the uh because they got their work in those in those two practices and speaking of joint practices the saints and texans did cancel their joint practice they're supposed to have two this upcoming week not open to the fans but it doesn't matter now the saints and texans will not be having joint practices um which is kind of disappointing i don't know if that means now we're going to see maybe the starters play a drive or two or a quarter in the texans game well i guess we'll see how the week progresses but we're here we are here to talk about the saints and chargers game and let's dive into that. And a quick little tidbit, Ronald Curry was calling the offensive plays, not Pete Carmichael. I thought that was interesting. I thought he did a pretty good job. I was a little confused with like some of the like third and long runs or third and long screens. But overall, I thought Ronald Curry did a good job. I think it's good for him in the case, what if Pete Carmichael is sick or he decides to retire or he gets fired. Ronald Curry to just step up and call plays. I think it's important he gets this experience and this exposure. And I think that would definitely help the Saints in the long term. Um, if P. Carmichael ever, you know, isn't in the building anymore and they need someone to step up, that could be Ronald Curry. So the first thing I have written down in my notes and what I want to kind of go over is the quarterback comp I get not competition but just the quarterbacks. Jameis Winston versus Jake Hayner. Jake Hayner looked a lot better. He looked a lot more composed and confident in what he was doing. I thought last week, he had a really rough start to his NFL career, but then again, it was his first NFL action, first NFL game. We might have been a little rough judging him and examining kind of what he was going through or kind of just how he played. He looked a lot better this week, was making really good throws. There wasn't really a throw where I thought, what is he doing? I thought almost all of his throws were on point. He did have a few overthrows, but overall I thought Jake Hanner looked really good. I think that drive last week really helped. He put together a game, I guess, tying drive, but the two-point didn't um, count. But I thought that drive he put together at the end of the game definitely helped his confidence coming into this game because now he's like, if I was able to do it, you know, two minutes left and get the team downfield, maybe I can do this, you know, throughout a whole game or at least in this scenario for the second half of a game. I thought he looked good. He had that rolling out pass deep to Kurt to John Trey Kirkland who he flashed a little bit and he has his, some special teams play but I thought Jake Hayner looked really good and um, there's something else I want to kind of go over but before we go into that Jameis Winston I thought Jameis looked 
okay, he had the really great pass to Kendra Miller and really good throw to Shaq Davis. But outside of that, he didn't look good. I thought he held onto the ball way too long. I thought Jameis Winston just had no pocket awareness, had no idea what to do. And it felt like he was just, just out there. And he is a nine-year starter or nine-year veteran. He's the number one overall pick. And I thought Jake Hayner, a fourth-round pick, looked better. I thought Jameis just had no pocket awareness. He was under-throwing passes. He held onto the ball too long. He had passes thrown behind his receivers. And he was taking hits and sacks. And when we were talking about offensive line, which will lead it, this is kind of our, this is our transition, I guess, from quarterback to offensive line play. But we, when Jameis Winston's at quarterback, we were always complaining about why is the offensive line not blocking for Jameis? Why is he always getting sacked? But when Jake Hayner takes over, it's not an issue. I think Jake Hayner makes the offensive line look better. Similar to how Drew Brees made his offensive line look, look better. He got it out faster. He's more confident in his throws. He did a good job of his pre-snap, uh, I guess, reads and adjustments, helping the offensive line. This guy's blitzing. This guy's blitzing. I think Hayner is more decisive. He got the ball out to his checkdowns and quick passes really fast. It felt like Jameis, he'd look at the checkdown, then he'd look downfield, then he'd run and scramble, and then check it down when the play's almost over or when there's a defender now next to the checkdown. It felt like Jameis Winston just didn't have any pocket awareness. He had those two really great throws. I'll give him that. But then after, um, after that pass to Shaq Davis at the end of the half, then he threw to Shaq Davis in quadruple coverage like what's happening like you're not in your veteran and you don't look better than this fourth round rookie quarterback you can't do a better job of pocket awareness or do a better job of pre-snap adjustments with the offensive line this is my just two cents on it i thought Jameis had his moments overall though i think hander does a better job with the system Obviously, you know, we're small sample sizes. James is still, I think, a better backup as of right now. I'd much rather have, if Derek Card goes down, please don't ever happen. I'd much rather have James probably right now. I think Hayner's just exposure and experience isn't there yet. Um, but James, he is what he is. He's never going to be a guy who does pre-snap adjustments and stuff like that to the offensive line. He, he's nine years into his NFL career. The pocket awareness is just a part of who he is he doesn't really have a good pocket awareness um but overall offensive line i couldn't tell if they were being playing good or playing bad hard to tell due to you know just quarterbacks and james winston's playing with the twos jake hanner's playing with the threes and jake hanner didn't get sacked james winston did i don't think that's a coincidence that's the second week in a row where james winston was sacked Jake Hayner wasn't, so I don't think that's a coincidence. But let's talk about a little bit on the offensive line now since we kind of led our way to this topic off of James Winston and Jake Hayner. So last week it was a concern, and going into this week it was also a concern that the offensive line depth is still a little scary. I think it is. Um, I think outside of the starting five and maybe like Andres Pete if he's a backup, it's a little concerning what this depth looks like. Um, but I think with the right quarterback, hence Jake Hayner, they look better than what they actually are. He got it out faster. He made pre-snap adjustments. In the first play of Jake Hayner's uh, half, they held up for a really long time. I think they held that pocket good for him for like four four seconds, and then Hayner rolled out and threw the pass to Kirkland. Um, offensive line, I still think it's a little scary, and I think the running, the run blocking still isn't there. I know they're not the starters, but... The Saints still didn't have a run over 10 yards that counted. They did have one from Darrell Williams, but there was a penalty which called it back. And the penalties were terrible. The Saints had 16 total penalties, 14 were accepted, 141 yards. We're going to get into penalties later on in the episode. But of those penalties, I believe eight of them were on the offensive line. And let me just double check my notes real quick of like how many. Um, there were three false starts four holding penalties, and one illegal man downfield. That is very concerning. Now, you could say, well, so a lot of these guys aren't going to be on the roster, maybe aside from Lewis Kidd, who is competing for a roster spot, but still, it's preseason. Dennis Allen needs to address these penalties. I thought the offensive, offensive line had its up and down moments, but overall, they need to be better, at least in the depth-wise. I know it's hard to find better depth and stuff like that, but still, I mean... They did not look that good, at least in the run game. 
pass protection was was iffy iffy or it was like I already mentioned I'm not going to repeat myself about the whole quarterback stuff but uh, that definitely had um, some impact on how the offensive line played I believe okay now that we've covered the first things that I wanted to cover let's go over the players who won from Sunday guys who are trending up rising on the roster and my number one guy is uh, Kendra Miller I think it was obvious that he is going to make the roster but I think it was important for him to have this this game last week had four carries for five yards then gets injured didn't participate really in OTAs or mini camp was there for training camp um, we didn't even know if he was going to play this week he was injured last week had to get scanning on his knee good news came back he was able to play this week uh, sat out one of the joint practices played in the second one I think that's important uh, on the day he had 10 carries for 23 yards and a rushing touchdown and had three catches for 36 yards in that diving uh, catch from James Winston I thought that was a really great play I thought he looked really good had a spin move I believe he had the longest run of the day that counted which was nine yards um, I thought he looked good obviously he is playing with the second string offensive line aside from Trevor Penning so um, we don't really know if you know the 10 for 23 could be just because he's not playing with the starting offensive lineman obviously those numbers will prob probably be better once he gets behind guys like Eric McCoy, Ryan Ramchick, Cesar Ruiz, and whoever's at left guard, whether it be Hurst or Pete. So I thought he looked good. And another thing that he did really good on was pass protection. During the Chargers and Saints joint practices, Jamal Williams did not look good in pass protection. Deborah Williams looked good in pass protection. There wasn't a lot about Kendra Miller. I thought he looked good. He had a few blitz pickups. Um, one specifically... Um, I want to say it was in the second quarter. There, the Saints were kind of in the red zone threatening, um, and he picked up a blitz, and I thought it was pretty good. And I think that's important, especially for a rookie in his, I guess, first game action or first start because I don't think he didn't start last week. Um, and this is his, I guess, biggest exposure to the NFL as of now. So I think it's important that we see him doing good in all three categories, rushing, receiving, and pass blocking. And he's showcasing that when Alvin Kamara is gone, that he can fill in and be a good addition to this team next to Jamal Williams and fill in when he has to. Second guy on the winner's list is Jake Hayner going 11 of 17 for 118 yards. And he did have a touchdown pass called back. And then he had a touchdown pass dropped. And then he had a touchdown pass again dropped. So I thought he looked good. I know I went over this earlier, but I just want to include him on this list. He looked poised, confident. I think that drive last week at the end of the game really helped his confidence coming into this game. He's like, if I was able to do this then, I could do this now. I thought that throw on the run to Kirkland was amazing. I Like I said, I'm not going to go into any more details, but he there wasn't really a throw where I was like, why are you making that throw? I thought majority of his throws were good reads and where they needed to be. And let's get into the next guy, Shaq Davis. What can I say? Before the game, before the the game, I tweeted out someone I want to see play a lot more and should be playing a lot more. Shaq Davis. He only got like 11 snaps last week. Had two catches for 20 yards, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'll put the tweet up. You probably already saw it. But Shaq Davis went off. Uh, had three catches for 63 yards. Two of them were contested catches. One of them he went up and caught it over a guy. It was really cool. And the other one was from James Winston before halftime. It was underthrown, kind of ish. He stopped and came back for the ball. I thought it was a really great play by Davis. Great concentration. And he did have a, a touchdown catch. He caught it, a one handed catch on a pick play on a screen. It was tipped, caught a one handed one in. There's a flag. We're going to get into that in just a moment. I thought he looked really good and he made a, an impact. You know, Trey Con Smith has been out. And you probably have four wide receivers solidified on the roster now with Thomas, Olave, uh, Rashid Shahid, and Perry. You probably have one, maybe two more roster spots at wide receiver. Because if Traquan Smith doesn't play this week, guys like Keith Kirkwood could fill in there. Shaq Davis could fill in there if he has a really good game or a good week. He might be a practice squad guy. Um, but if you release him and he goes on waivers, I guarantee you someone's going to pick him up. And Lynn Bowden, who had a pretty good uh, screenplay got some nice blocks but his value is special teams as a kick returner and a punt returner so those guys could film there and they're all competing for basically one spot maybe two if that and i thought shock davis showed the showcase that he can uh, make plays he did last week had a diving like 
backwards catch uh, against Kansas City. I thought that was a really good catch. Almost had a one-handed touchdown catch, uh, but was held. I thought he really made a point that, hey, I could be a good practice squad guy. Maybe I could make this roster or maybe be like a practice squad elevation guy a few times this season. I thought he looked really good. He was targeted five times. Once was overthrown from Jake Hayner, and the other one, he was in quadruple coverage. Um, I don't I already said that earlier, but the only downside to Shaq Davis, I had this in my notes, I just, um, I couldn't remember what I had written down, but the only downside to Shaq Davis is he doesn't play any special teams, and that's kind of a downside. Lynn Bowden might just make the team because he can play special teams in addition to wide receiver. Um, he doesn't, Shaq Davis doesn't play gunner or kickoff or kick return or anything like that. He's 6'5", you could say moving to tight end, he's too skinny for your, his frame is too small and skinny for that. And I think he's just a pure wide receiver. And that's the only downside to him. So we'll see how this week goes and how next in the final preseason game goes. But if I was a, if I was to take a guess, he'd probably be the practice squad guy, but probably the number one guy. Like if someone got injured, they'd probably bring him up first before anyone else. And the final winner of Sunday's game over the Chargers, win over the Chargers, my bad, is defensive end Nico Lelos. Man, did this guy go off. I knew who he was, but I wasn't really expecting him to really do anything during camp or anything like that. Maybe have a few solid run stuffs, but I wasn't expecting him to do anything. And he played in the XFL this past season, which probably helped him. Um, at least as of now, you know, he, he played back in spring. He's in shape and stuff like that. This dude went off. He had five tackles, four tackles for a loss, three sacks, and one pass deflection. That is insane. He is... I mean that that is like a that is an all pro season, preseason game right there. If I'm putting him in the preseason Hall of Fame with Marquez Callaway, like I am, he might be better than preseason Marquez Callaway. If I'm gonna be realistic, I thought he went, was really good. Obviously, you know he's playing the third string Charger offensive lineman, but still that is really good stat line. And the Saints might be looking at that saying, "Hey, this guy did good. Maybe we bump him up next week. Have him going against." The second strings and if he does decent then maybe practice squad i don't know if he has adds any value to special teams which i know matters a lot to the saints but um i mean if he has half of the performance he had uh sunday against the chargers he could be a practice squad guy maybe get a few uh games in depending on injuries and who's available who the va- availability of the saints defense of linemen and etc stuff like that Okay, so we just went over the winners and guys who are trending up and rising on the roster spots and on everyone's radar. Now let's talk about the losers. And number one is Brian Edwards. He lost his spot today. He absolutely just, or yesterday, he lost his roster spot. And it wouldn't be surprising if he got cut before this final preseason game to give guys like Shaq Davis or Lynn Bowden more opportunities to play Sunday against the Texans. Two penalties that called back touchdowns, both on pick plays, big old zero, zero catches, zero receptions, dropped a p- p- dropped a perfect, beautiful pass from Jake Hayner on the fade route. Man, he did not look good. He lost his roster spot, and I guess he's probably going to take it. There's 53 spots on this team. He probably just lost his opportunity to take one. Jalen Smith probably took his, the veteran linebacker. I didn't have on, I didn't have him on the winners list because um, he there was only like two plays that were notable. They were really big plays, but I didn't want to put him in just for two plays. But Jalen Smith probably filled in where Brian Edwards is being taken out, at least on the roster spot of numbers. Man, he did not look good. Brian Edwards, two costly penalties. The Saints still won. But man, a pick play, he's out there blocking five yards downfield in the end zone. All he has to do is run a slant and it's a touchdown for the Saints. Another one running crossing around. The other one I couldn't tell looked like he might have like tripped the defender or something. But either way, two costly penalties that costed the Saints two touchdowns. Cannot happen. He lost his spot today. And now since we're on the topic of penalties, 14 penalties were accepted. 16 total penalties. That is unacceptable. How does that happen? Dennis Allen said post that was the one of the very first things he mentioned he did not like the penalties he did not like them they need to be better in their technique they need to be better in their discipline um, I didn't like um, I didn't like the penalties 
it's way too many. Um, so that's something we got to get cleaned up. Uh, yeah, you talk about cleaning up penalties. What, what are some of the things you do in, when it's kind of Well, look, so the pre-snap penalties can't, can't happen. Um, you know, that's just a total lack of focus. Um, and so that's got to get cleaned up. And then really you got to look at the tape and you got to, you got to determine from a technical standpoint, what could you have done better technique wise to put yourself in a better position, you know, specifically on some of the holding calls. Um, and look from my vantage point, I, you know, I um, you could argue that the guys who committed these penalties are not going to be playing come week one. And aside from probably two guys, Paulson and Debo had a penalty, and Lonnie Johnson and Lewis Kidd, who's fighting for a roster spot. Those are the only three players who committed, uh, or the only three, I guess, like starters who committed penalties. And, and uh, let me, here, I have it pulled up. Paulson Adebo committed one, Lonnie Johnson committed one, and Lewis Kidd committed two. So that's four penalties from like starters or guys who probably have a better chance at making this roster. Everyone else, man, it, it was rough. 141 total yards of penalties. 13 different guys were flagged. The only people who were had like multiple penalties, Brian Edwards, Lewis Kidd, Storm Norton, they, they didn't look that good. Um, penalties, penalties, penalties. Those are drive killers. Those are self-inflicting wounds, and that's how you lose games. And before people comment in the comment section that like, this is Dennis Allen, Dennis Allen's fault. He doesn't know how to discipline teams. Sean Payton had this issue too. I pulled up a random game from 2020. Saints and Raiders. The Saints had 10 penalties for 129 yards. That that's a Sean Payton. He was the coach at that time. Sean Payton had his issues too with penalties. The Saints will attempt to clean them up. It was an issue at the start of the season last season, as were fumbles. Fumbles, as of right now, aren't an issue. Knock, knock on, knock on wood. And but penalties need to be cleaned up. That's it. The next loser from Sunday's game, or I guess the guy trending down. I don't call him a loser because I mean he's an NFL player. I'm, I'm on YouTube. So Lucas Kroll is i guess the guy who's trending down on the roster spot or the roster list dropped a touchdown from jay kaner dropped a pass from james winston man he it was rough out there for him he was targeted eight times only caught three of them for 30 yards there is a slim margin for error uh to make a roster spot it's in the nfl in in a crowded room at the tight end position with juan foster morrow Taysom hill and jimmy graham those are probably four guys who are probably making the team. You cannot be having the errors and mistakes that he had if you're trying to make the team. I think he lost his spot unless he just goes Jerry Rice next week. But he's probably the he is the next guy on my down downers list. The the losers from Sunday's game and the final guy. He was better than last week. He had four pressures. But he still didn't flash that much as Isaiah Foskey. He had a few moments there was a pressure where he almost had a sack, but couldn't finish the play. Dove too soon. And another play. All he has to do is contain the edge and set the edge and contain the quarterback. Went for the running back. Easton Stick ran for a touchdown. It was bad. His job as the edge guy is to contain the outside and contain the edge. Didn't do it. Yeah, look, I mean, I think, that, look, that was a play that I thought he should have been able to finish and make the play, you know. Um, and so I expressed to him that I expect him to be able to make that play. That's why we drafted him where we drafted him. And, uh, and so now, that being said, man, I've seen some improvement out of this player. Um, I've seen him cut it loose a little bit. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, I mean, I th you know. I, I hold him to a standard that, you know, a standard of expectation that, um, you know, he should have made that play. That's that's the way I feel. And it seems like he's going to be a project. I think what's Im kind of important is that we saw improvement from last week. He made more plays, or I guess he didn't make more plays, but he was more noticeable. Last week I didn't notice him at all, and he played like 40 snaps. 
This week I notice him a bit more. I think that's important. But I think it's also good too. Carl Granderson and Peyton Turner are flashing. It's putting less pressure on Isaiah Foskey. He can learn kind of this year. But as of right now, I don't have any expectations for him going into the regular season. I don't think he'll be a big impact player. I think this year he probably has to sit and learn and figure out how he can improve upon his game because he just kind of looks stiff out there. So that covers it for the winners and losers from Sunday's game against the Chargers. And we are going to go into the performance of the day, who had the best game. And I'm going with Nico Lelos. Five tackles, four TFLs, three sacks, and a pass deflection. One drive, he had a pass deflection and two sacks, like back to back to back. He's my performer of the day, player of the day. Um, I don't think I really need to go into any more detail. He just looked really good out there. He made an impact, and that's important. He could end up on the practice squad. He could be an elevation guy. If he played special teams, he could be a special teams guy. Who knows? But he made it a, made a case for his name being on the practice squad or roster spot come cut day. Moments of the day, best play. I have the Kendra Miller wheel route. It was a great throw. It was a great route. Great play call from Ronald Curry getting man-to-man -man coverage on a wheel route to Kendra Miller, the rookie diving catch. I thought it was amazing. And my biggest takeaway, aside from everything I've already mentioned, is the turnovers. Saints didn't turn the ball over, and they took the ball away three times. That's important. Dennis Allen emphasized turnovers going into training camp and OTAs. and wanted more turnovers. wanted to see more from his defense. Last week, I believe they had two or three takeaways. This week, they have three. So that let's say they had two last week. That's five takeaways in two games. That's awesome. And I'm pretty sure they've only turned the ball over once on offense. Jay Kaner to James Washington, it was picked off. But I'd say that's a pretty good ratio as of now. And that will do it for this episode. Hopefully you enjoyed it. And make sure you are subscribed. We're pretty close to 1K. We're at 600-something. And it would be very much appreciated. And I'll see you guys later this week.